ranked as a top tier employment attorney, featured on CNN Money, numerous awards for best employment law, a fierce advocate fighting for your legal needs. Welcome to Legal Views with your host, Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Welcome, welcome to Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. We are located here in Clayton, Missouri, 231 South Beamston Avenue, Clayton, Missouri, Suite, 8, 1, Suite 800. The phone number here is 314-854-1339. And we are so excited today. We have two outstanding guests with us. They are leaders, women, female leaders that are doing a phenomenal job and their work is so far reaching, it can be felt across the United States. And you are going to hear from these ladies. And the interesting thing about these ladies are they are sisters, blood sisters. Okay. And both of them have done phenomenal work in the community to help families. And we're going to use the terminology today uh, as at promise families, at promise children. Their work and their partnerships and their partnerships with faith based groups have led to the success of many families and many children. We have with us our guest, CEO, and president of the Deaconess Foundation, Mrs. Bethany Bovey Johnson. And I, I know I messed that name up. Let me try it again. Bethany Johnson Javar. How's that? Right. And we also have with us Dean Cynthia Williams from Washington University. And we are excited about these young ladies being with us on today. I apologize for messing up your French name, okay. <laughs> but we're live and I, I should have practiced a little bit. Tell us, welcome, first of all, welcome and just say hello to our audience. I'll jump in by saying hello and to whenever you're watching this, greetings. And thank you so much, Attorney Stewart, for having us on to talk with you again today. Well, great, great. And Dean Williams. Attorney Stewart, thank you so much for having us. And thank you to your audience as well. And actually, I think you, you, we're making history. This is the first time I've been on the platform with my sister. So thank oh, you. Wow, 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 wow. Well, that is really good. And I want to welcome uh, Miss Lena Porter Light to the show. She is such a, a faithful individual. And I really appreciate you following the show and all of the nice comments that you put up regarding our show. As you all know, this is International Women's Month. This is the last Saturday of the month. And we yes. wanted to uh, discuss some issues as it relates to women in leadership. We want to discuss issues as it relates to partnerships and so forth, and just give you some resourceful information to help you in whatever type of strategy you may be working on at this time. So uh, before we get started, uh, let's start with uh, Dean Cynthia Williams. Just give them a quick overview of our listeners of the work that you do and how your partnerships, you're the Dean of Partnerships, how that type of work can be impactful to uh, community-based organizations, the city as a whole, and to faith-based faith, faith -based groups. Well, thank you, Attorney Stewart. The work that I do at, at Brown School, at the Brown School at Washington University, uh, the Brown School is a, a high-rated uh, university that has a uh, few programs, and one of them is social work, public health, and social policy. Within the Brown School, my role is to build partnerships and to sustain relationships and to have presence in the community for the Brown School. Now, the reason I keep stressing the Brown School is because Washington University is large. It has seven schools. Mm -hmm. No one person can represent the whole entire university except for the chancellor right so right. i can i'm going to normalize this by saying my role and i'm privileged to have that role is to be the liaison for the brown school 
into the community. And specifically, my work has uh, centered on North City, North County, East St. Louis, and South City. Well, that's and, yes. phenomenal. If the Lord will bless me to see this October, this will be my 42nd year at the Brown School. Really? Yeah. You only look 42. Well, that is I love you. We give you. Well, thank you. Congrat congratulations on your sustainability and the great work that you are doing. And let's look at these communities for a second. Then we want to um, speak with uh, Dr. John Dr. Johnson Javal about her work and how many of the things that she does it actually can dovetail into the work that you do. Now, these communities that you primarily represent, many of them are uh, black and brown communities, individuals that uh, it's a lot of trauma in these communities. And there's a lot of gun violence in these communities that you provide the services uh, that you have. Can you tell us about some of the partnerships, the services that are directly delivered to those individuals that reside in, in, in those communities that you spoke of? Well, Attorney Stewart, thank you for giving me an opportunity to kind of reframe. Yes, there is violence and yes, there is um, other negative aspects in every community. Yeah. But in within the communities that you specifically name, there is a lot of strength and a lot of assets. And we there are foundational beliefs that individuals and families and groups are worthy of access to supports that are needed. So when you go into community, any community, you must go in with that asset-based mindset because communities are surviving. It might be difficult. They might not be invested in like other communities are. We have already dubbed them as vulnerable, but they're really communities that have been systematically oppressed intentionally and systematically oppressed. Now, when you think of communities that way, who still survive, who still get up and go to work, who still send their children to school, who still manage to make it day after day, I, I appreciate it, you calling them at promise communities, no longer vulnerable communities, because that takes the blame, puts the blame on individuals and communities where the blame should be really placed on systems that intentionally oppress communities. So latter part of your question, what is being done? Number one, the language has to be changed. The perspective has to be changed. We have to stop coming from a deficit model when we're talking about black and brown people because we are survivors, male and female. We make something basically out of nothing. The word resilience, it kind of wears on me a little bit, but we are resilient. Mm -hmm. But more than that, we are powerful, creative, and we are able to move systems. That's mm -hmm. how we got President Biden elected as well as President Obama. That's, that's I love your analysis on how resilient and that we cannot uh, put the blame on the individuals that are in those communities, but look at the systems that are in place uh, that continues to create those uh, communities and so forth. And I don't know about the part about President Obama and President Biden, you know, it, to each his own. I'm not against them, but I am saying that oftentimes who's in the White House, it does not transition the condition of the people that's living in these communities. That is and true. lots of times we, uh, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, and I want uh, Dr. Johnson to jump in. Lots of times, in my opinion, you know, we, we want certain people in, in the uh, White House, and that's key. That's mm -hmm. significant. We need to vote. Mm -hmm. However, there is no impact oftentimes. The conditions of the communities, they get worse. And so therefore, we have to look at other strategies to improve the conditions of how people live. Your thoughts, your thoughts, Ms. Uh, Javar. So, you know, politics is local first. We misstep when we only vote once every four years nationally. 
-hmm. prioritizing what happens locally is so important. We have midterm elections that'll be coming up next year. We have votes on the ballot in April primaries. And we typically forget that. But the truth is the person who is most attentive to your needs, your listeners needs, they need to be like understanding who represents them at the local level. Politics and healthcare are local, just like religion and everything else. It's all mm -hmm. local. Right. What are, what are your thoughts as it relates to imp uh, the services that the partnerships are creating uh, yeah. that's improving uh, the conditions in the community. Do you think we are strengthening our communities more? Do you think they're still lagging behind? And the third part of that, what can we do differently? So I'll start uh, in context of what we can do differently. Number one is um, this, this whole thing about reframe is important. We are no longer the minority. We are not minority people. In fact, we are people of the global majority. Black and brown people are BIPOC, black indigenous people of color. We are the global majority. And identifying as such gives us a power of strength. We need to be really thoughtful about nonprofit. Nonprofit are the folks who do the programmatic services. And as my sister just stated, structurally, sometimes nonprofit, not all nonprofit is set up to make people be independent of their services. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they set up so that you have to keep coming back and get dependent on the services. So what's going to be important is healthy interdependence. We want families to be resilient strong, healthy, and interdependence. Yes, of course, you have some, some downtimes, you need support. But what we want is economic, spiritual, emotional, social independence from systems through health, through well-being, through healing. Very good. Very good. And if I was to add to that, I mm -hmm. would have to say that I think um, universities, high schools, we have to start teaching a different language as it relates to black and brown people, black and brown communities. Because once uh, once communities have been painted uh, across, you know, the board as a certain within a certain status quo, yes, it will hinder uh, the, the quality of life. People feel they don't they, they will not feel safe living there, visiting there, doing business there. The dollar will not turn over in those communities because people say, well, I'm not going over there. I may get shot. So we, so when we start changing the language of how we see these different communities and talk more about the services that are being provided, the services from the Deaconess Foundation, the services from Washington University, one of the top schools in the nation. And when we began to say that we have partnerships in this particular community, that will give a different um, uh, perspective of how we view individuals who live there and how we view individuals that uh, do business there. Can you just take a moment, um, uh, Dr. Java, and tell us about the Deaconess Foundation and the role you serve there? Sure. Deaconess Foundation that's physically located with the Home for the Mission on Van Deventer, not too far uh, from, from, let's see, Van Deventer and Forest Park Parkway. We are a foundation that centers child well-being because the vision is to have a healthy metropolitan area, meaning both the eastern side of um, our southern Illinois and also the, the, the little bit more than St. Louis area. Some of our funding that we receive is through being a hospital conversion. So when there was a Deaconess Hospital, as some of your uh, audience knows, we sold that hospital. And so those assets were contained for the sole purpose of prioritizing children, youth, and families intergenerationally on both sides of the river. That is so awesome. Congratulations on, you. on your position there and congratulations on the work that you are doing. Uh, you all have a program called Freedom Schools. Can you just tell us a little bit about the Freedom Schools? I think that model that you yeah. have for those schools can be duplicated throughout the United States. Let's, let's tell yes. individuals about that information. And that's the goal, God willing. So since 2017, Deaconess Foundation, in its partnership nationally with the Children's Defense Fund, has been sponsoring 
Freedom Schools. It's a summer program for children from K through five. It is in St. Louis City and County. We partner right now with United Church of Christ Churches, but we're hoping to expand that to keep your eyes and ears open. But those churches, we're prioritizing North City and North County. We also are partnering with two local school districts, St. Louis Public and Webster Groves. Part of what you can find in Freedom Schools is free for all families and primarily focused on literacy enrichment. Freedom mm -hmm. Schools model is rooted in culturally relevant pedagogy. And here's what we found that I'm most excited to share. We measure academic progress through testing and evaluation of our scholars mm -hmm. and have remarkable learning gains with more than 80% maintaining or gaining instructional reading levels and increasing reading levels by as much as one year and six months in a seven week period in uh, you know, during the time that they're together with us for about eight to 10 weeks during the summertime. So it's really important. The first half day is intense pedagogy, but the other part of the day is play, learning and engagement with community and with leaders. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, please come and connect with us at deaconess.org to apply for your children. And there's also some job opportunities for those who are looking for summer employment. Oh, wow. Can you t explain more uh, in layman's term what pedagogy yeah. means? So so many times we find that our children do not find themselves reflected in the teaching, in the curriculum, in the visualizations. So books that look like us, with leaders like us, with chants that talk about I think I can be what I want to be. Those types of mantras also in the way that African people, we have chants and we are tribal and we are people who are interconnected. We try to bring community and those same roots back into the curriculum and our children respond to seeing their identity being bold and beautiful and black and amazing. And test scores, reading scores go up uh, and they have fun too. And I think that is very key because when you can see Yes, uh, the significance of who you are reflected in the work. That's it right. gives you it gives uh, it raises the self uh, confidence, self esteem, because now you feel and believe that you matter. And when people believe that they matter, there's just more of, I believe, of a dedication and a commitment to what an individual uh, is trying to achieve. Now, Dean Williams, let me ask you a question. You all have uh, some programs that were tailored for African-American men to provide some uh, safeguarding uh, for against violence and so forth. And these programs were primarily developed after the uh, Michael Brown uh, tragic incident. Can you tell us about these programs and how they have been impactful in our communities? Oh, you're speaking of homegrown St. Louis. Yes, and that is an initiative at the Brown School that is actually the founder is Dr. Sean Joe, and I have the privilege of working with him. That initiative has an ambitious goal, but an attainable goal, and that is to strengthen or change the trajectory, financial trajectory, and um, of 60,000 Black male locally. So, this is a program or initiative like none other in any part of the country where the idea is to coordinate services among organizations who are already committed to supporting black males in the region, but do it in a way that is coordinated and more impactful. And on top of that, to prioritize. So while the, so the, um, objective might be in many organizations to service everyone. Homegrown actually prioritizes Black males 12 to 29 years old. So it's amazing that you're asking about that initiative because the uh, Regional Steering Committee has just been convened with many local leaders, including state and city government. So that makes that an exciting venture. Uh, we're just really beginning to do that work. I have an opportunity to work with Dr. Joe uh, to advance that initiative. So we're, we're beginning with the pilot study. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. The co-chairs are actually 
Valerie Patton and Dr. Flint Fowler. So they're co-chairing that regional steering committee and currently the strategies are being developed and in place, but the objectives might be change, changing just a little bit as we do more research and learn about issues in the region. Wow, 60,000? 60,000. That is amazing. How do you plan if, I mean, if you have the information um, available, how do you plan to recruit and to identify identify those 60,000 males? Well, from that initiative, and again, Dr. Joe is the expert, but what again, he's working with organizations. So this is the unique thing. Homegrown is not trying to reinvent the wheel. Okay. Homegrown understands that there are organizations who already have their foot in the door. Are, hmm. This is already part of their mission. And so the idea is to how do we attract them there to reach out through the organizations who have those young men and the difference, make them a priority. So homegrown would be the connector that makes the young men priorities through a system that actually tracks who is working with them. They would have a coach uh, to help them change their trajectory with regard to safety, personal safety, education, financial uh, capabilities, et cetera. So there are seven pillars that's associated with that. But it's a great question. We could, no one organization could do it, but an organization that acts as a conduit for those organizations to track the progress, we have a chance in the region to not only do it, but be a model for the country. That is, th that program will definitely be a model for the country. And okay. you heard it first here on Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. That is, awesome. you women are to be, you know, just really praised for the work that you are doing together, not together, but it does tell. And it's just amazing how no one has brought you all together be before now, because both of you, you just have such a, uh, in-depth story to tell. What are your thoughts on this uh, homegrown program, uh, Dr. Javal? Uh, well, first, I just want to say thank you for even elevating that. Typically, what happens with Black women is that our story is not told. Um, our story is not prioritized. What we contribute is appreciated because it benefits so many, of course. I mean, African women rule the world. Um, this is true, but that story is not told. So the way with which we support one another, as you always have, Sheila, is really important because if we don't support ourselves, it's not going to happen. In terms of homegrown, I've been really privileged to also support the leadership of my sister and Dr. Joe's work. And what we're looking forward to is the way with which homegrown will be able to organize money. Mm -hmm. and organizing money and bringing that national money into this region to then prioritize the organizations that prioritize our people and then demonstrate outcomes that mm -hmm. close those economic inequities, those health inequities, and absolutely bolster our folks. We're looking at generational change and policy change. I mean, that that is if there is a silver bullet, that is the model that's going to do that. And I have confidence it's going to happen soon. OK, now. Let's look at for a few moments this whole issue of International Women's History Month. Okay. And since you let's let's go with the comment that you made that the story of black women is not often told. And if you were to tell the story of black women today, what would your story, how would your narrative sound? If you were you're given this platform, what is your narrative? as it relates to black women in leadership and the lack of uh, exposure that we mm -hmm. get. I think the way that I can jump in and then ask my sister to jump in, I think about it like the title of a book, what would the title be? And it would be, um, you know, a song of triumph and a cautionary tale at the same time, I think is the story of African diaspora women everywhere, including here. Um, part of it is about the beauty of overcoming, but that beauty of overcoming has cost us so much. I'd be remiss because we are on legal views to think about uh, Cora Faith Walker, who was an attorney, who was a social justice advocate, who was one of my sisters in the fight here in St. Louis, mm -hmm. who lost her life at age 37. 
Um, you know, so the toll that it takes to have the fight and to fight the good fight is significant in our body, uh, in our spirit. And that typically we get celebrated for the sacrifice, maybe just a little bit, sometimes used for the sacrifice, but not really valued and supported the way that I think we definitely should be. And what would you, and what would you add to that, um, Dean Williams? Uh, Tony Stewart, I would add, I take a page out of Maya Angelou's book and still I rise or her poem. Uh, when you look at the obstacles that black women have had to endure going back to slavery. And sometimes I hated that people, maybe some younger people and older are, are tired or embarrassed by references to slavery. But you, if you want to go back and see some real strength and resilience, talking about oppressed communities, Harriet Tubman, you look at the women uh, who led men and women and children <clears throat> through obstacles at risk of life and limb. So I would have to go, go way back. I'd have to go back to the history on the continent of Africa. We'd have to just, we don't have to dig deep. It, it's everywhere. And, and I know this sounds cliche, but Shoot, African, uh, 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 Black history is American history. Uh, it's part of the DNA of this country. And so when you say the story of Black women have not been told, it is true, but we're, we're, we're changing that. that. That's going to end. All we need are people and platforms like yours, Attorney Stewart, to get to just sing the song and still I rise. Wow, that's deep. That's deep. And when I think about the, the narrative, and let me acknowledge uh, Mother Flora Cooper, who's watching us, a, a, a phenomenal leader in her own right. Well, when I think about uh, the narrative of Black women, I one of the things I think of, it, it, I get sad for mm -hmm. a moment here. And one of the reasons that saddens me, you know, I don't stay sad, but it's mm -hmm. I feel that Black women are the least promoted, the least protected, yeah. and the least respected in many areas of life. And we have to fight so hard to uh, get our story out, uh, to be respected in certain uh, genres of life. And I, I find that sad. And then after many, many years of, of excelling and triumph, and performance, mm -hmm. excellent performance. You, it's still many, oftentimes, that's not a word, oftentimes it is not enough. And that is the narrative that has to change. It has, we have to be looked upon as it is enough. And to think about uh, our sister, Judge Kantanji uh, Brown Jackson, mm -hmm. she is the most, uh, one of the most qualified Supreme Supreme Court jurors uh, nominee in the history of the Supreme Court nomination process. Mm -hmm. Highly qualified. And some of the things that have were stated to her, how she was treated, she held her composure. She was very uh, respectful. It, it, you know, being that qualified, it just it wasn't enough. And then after being that qualified, one of the uh, Republican senators said, well, she definitely will not get my vote. I mean, just, you know, um, like Amy, uh, Supreme Court jurist Amy uh, Barry, she was very qualified, you know, and I found no fault in her. I thought she had achieved. She's done well. She has a beautiful family and it didn't take me long to get there. OK. But why does it take so long for us to get there when it comes to a black woman? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I, when when they nominated Amy Comey uh, Barrett, people said things. But when I looked at her record, she had done some great things. But this particular jurist, she goes beyond everyone that's on that court. Her experience, her trial experience, her education, her academic record—it is stellar. But it's not enough. What are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Javar, and then Dean Williams? I, I watched um, portions of uh, you know the hearings on this week, 
structural racism uh, is at play. Um, the fact that she stood her ground, as you said, thoughtfully, but also made a very good distinction every single time when they would ask her a question to trap her, to be able to say, if what you're asking me was your responsibility to fix. And until you fix the things that we refer to with which to make judgments, that's really on you, but in my role. So she is just, as you said, I, fa I found no fault in her. Um, it is about racism. It is about denigration. It really was about politics and posturing for the next election coming up. That wasn't for what we saw. That was for their base to get them back in office. Okay, can you define, uh, in layman's terms, structural racism? Yeah, Cindy, you want to take that one, or you want me? Go ahead, B. Okay, uh, structural racism goes beyond how individual people act with each other. It is about the fact that we know and believe that this country was built on money being valuable and on black bodies being commodities and all of the generational wealth that has been built has been built on a structure that the engine was economic mm -hmm. with which we were part of that structure. Enslavement is really about the structure of that. So all institutions, banking, education, you keep naming them, all of them, philanthropy included, which I'm now in, was built on the structures of benefiting some by the color of their skin and intentionally denigrating, exposing and murdering many others who were seen to not be valuable. And that has been in policy in the United States to make that structural and policy oriented. Okay, so let me play devil's advocate. Someone say, oh, I am so tired of this narrative about slavery and racism. That was 400 years ago. It had nothing to do with my family. It has nothing to do with my generation uh, or the generation before me. Uh, uh, black people now, they go to college, they go to Harvard. We've had a black president that I do not believe in structural racism. I believe that individuals have had the same opportunities uh, that you that we have that the that the so-called majority has, and uh, how can you still claim that narrative? What what is what would be your response to that, uh, Dean Williams? Well, uh, my my immediate response in my head would be: I go back to my biblical roots. Answer not a fool according to his folly. That's absolutely ridiculous. As in when uh, one of our high level rappers who's having a mental breakdown now said that 400 years of being a slave sounds like that was something that you invested in or were intentional. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm, right. so, so there are, there are, are constantly, you're going to have those individuals who have that attitude, that narrative. But as again, as the scripture says, what if some don't believe who cares? We move forward because the narrative is, is not a narrative. It is part of American history. And so we keep working the work. That's one reason why I'm not retired today. I am determined that I still have work to do in the area of educating people and holding institutions accountable. So it doesn't bother me at all. It's just another, uh, I hope, this is not offensive to you, Attorney Stewart. It's just another fool who has not done their homework and life will tell them. Life has a way of helping you to understand what someone else was going through. That's that's a deep response. What would be your response to that? Because I, I hear that. I had a client once and she was a Caucasian woman. And she said to me, we were working on a case, and, uh, and I was asking her some questions and she stated to me, she said, I have not had the opportunities that you've had. You're a lawyer and I couldn't go to school and, and my family uh, didn't have any money. And, and I grew up in this type of a home and I didn't get my education. And I had all of these things, things working against me. And then she said, and you probably, somebody like you probably wouldn't understand. Mm. And I was, I was like, man, how do I even respond? 
to that wow. type of, of uh, thinking. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't just drop out the sky like this. I mean, I, I, I've been through some things, yeah. and I, I have personally have experienced uh, racism, and I don't apply that as a brush for everyone because I don't believe everyone is racist. I don't believe every institution is racist, but I have experienced racism. Mm -hmm. And so what is your response to, to individuals that don't, they don't wanna hear that 400 year slavery narrative anymore? Especially, uh, you know, you, you, you all had a black president, you all had a black president. That, I mean, that doesn't make sense. What, are your, what would be your response to that? Yeah, you know, I would say they don't wanna hear it because they benefit from it so much. Mm -hmm. um, and those that are denying it aren't typically part of the group that it is. And then you have others like Clarence Thomas who, you know, are tokenized as well in that. What I've chosen to do with my time is to prioritize my work. I need to make sure that my spirit and my soul are liberated from ways that it is in the air. You know, we too can model oppression. I personally cannot be racist, but I am in a racist system and I can mark out and walk out those things. So I need to be free of that myself. Make sure that when I'm in space with black women, I'm uplift women, I'm uplifting them, I'm supporting them, I'm doing everything I can. I don't break them down because that is a function of internalized racism. So I make sure I do my part. And for those that feel a different way, I'm at the point where I organize and prioritize with those who are like minded. And I do have ladders that invite people into discussion. But to be honest, white people need to do their work with their colleagues to bring them along. That's not our work. Our work is to make sure that people of the global majority are healed and are walking in liberation and freedom. That comes in my in my lane through Christ and through, again, addressing policy structures and systems in addition to programs programs that help to make sure that generationally we start lifting as we rise. Okay, that's good. Now, let me give my spin on this. I believe um, that racism exists. C clearly, I believe that, that racism exists. Mm -hmm. However, I don't necessarily believe that all institutions have structural racism. Okay. I don't necess I necessarily don't believe that all institutions have structural racism. I do believe that people come to the table with uh, implicit biases and the cognitive dissonance schema, the, how they were raised and the mindset of some people creates racism for others. But I, I do not believe that all institutions are racist. I do not believe that uh, all ind all white individuals are, are racist. Now, I'm not saying you're saying that, but I do believe there are people in, that are in charge that will create uh, um, a system that would make it difficult for other people to get ahead. And, 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 this, and this foundational belief goes back to uh, the days of Harriet Tubman. There could have never been a Harriet Tubman if there would not have been the partnership with white individuals that assisted her to get those people uh, on the railroad, the Underground Railroad, I'm speaking in terms of. Uh, mm -hmm. There were, there were. I'm trying to think of those, the name of those people. Uh, it wasn't Quakers, but it was, uh, I yeah. can't, I'm sorry. You're talking about Puritans? That uh, yeah, that, that, that worked with uh, individuals. So I always believe that there's always a remnant. And there's always resistance is what your point is. Absolutely. No, no, no. It's always a remnant. God is going to always have a remnant somewhere of somebody that's going to do right. That's what I'm saying. I believe that personally. I don't, so that's why I, I don't I don't em, em necessarily embrace a narrative that is just straight across the board like that. Because I believe no matter what it looked like, God is yet in control. Some somebody, God got somebody in control somewhere that will do his uh do his will. And that you can only go so far. You know, Abraham was saying that God suffered no man to do him wrong or harm. I don't, maybe that was uh Jacob that said that. <laughs> One of them said it. But there, I believe that there are people in place to help. Okay. What are your thoughts on that? I'm just interested in 
people, some people will say, no, nah, Sheila, I don't, I don't believe that. But I just, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Come on with it. I'll jump in and say this. Attorney Stewart, I would just say, use your discernment because you will be surprised how prevalent white supremacist values permeate even black led organizations. So we have to be careful as leaders with regard to our mission, our values, our principles, our practices. We have to use a discerning eye and ask the questions, who's being left out? Whose voices are we not hearing? Who is being, a, who are we uh, unintentionally oppressing? So while there might not be intentional racist values and things in place, you, you keep your eye on it because it is very prevalent throughout uh, the teaching and the orientations and the prop, uh, propaganda that is uh, promoted about uh, communities that have been oppressed. So on one hand, I, I can say I get where you're coming from, but my caveat is this, keep your eye out and make sure that you're correct and be prepared when you see the remnants of white supremacy to be ready to address it. Don't assume it's not there not even in your own organization, not even in a black led organization, because we can be influenced and we are influenced by a lot. What do you think, Bethany? I feel like to your point, Attorney Stewart, I'm part of the remnant. I'm part of the preserved ones, the called out ones that understand very specifically according to how the Holy Spirit breathes upon me to be able to discern one thing from another. So to your point, every generation, there will always be, when I was saying earlier, there will always be the movement that resists the culture and the structure. And there will always be those that will pop up to keep the status quo. You just got to be clear whose side not are you leaning on. You got you to gotta pick a side. Mm -hmm. And this time of resistance and upheaval with all that is surrounding us in the end times that we're in, it makes you choose and pick a side. That's that's my contribution to the conversation. Yeah, because I, I, I my foundational belief is that God is always in control. We don't always understand how life moves and how people move. But we do know that the fact that you have the job, this is how I see it, the fact that you have the job as dean of uh, community partnerships at a prestigious university, and you're able to collaborate and build partnerships to funnel resources and services and to teach individuals that are hurting and to get resources to those individuals to rebuild and to build their lifestyle. That's an example of God being in control. And if he wasn't in control, you wouldn't be there, you know? And the same thing with uh, uh, Dr. Javon, she wouldn't be there. And so I, I see that as God's hand in things, that's me. OK, and so the fact that uh, the Klan exists, that doesn't nullify what God can yet do through his people. And I don't give them that level of authority and I don't give them that level of reach. OK, now, I'm not ignorant. I know people have been gone through a lot of stuff, hung and lynched. I know that. But I'm talking about today. I, I'm not giving them that level of reach and authority. Okay, uh, let's get some comments on this and then let's wrap it up to the, to the next question I have. Any comments on it? I see you smiling, Doc. I see you smiling, Dean. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, I, I totally agree with you that God is in control, but the scripture also tells us many are called, but few are chosen. You know why? Because not everybody is obedient and willing to make the sacrifices it means to be a dean at a prestigious university or a, a president at a, a highly 
um, visible organization. Those mm -hmm. come with risk. Those come with a lot of critique. And you had better put your faith in God and trust God to help you be appropriate, represent him and advance the greater good for all. You see, mm -hmm. for all. And if you and when you're when you're careful, you can advance uh, uh, the greater good for black and brown community, black, brown and red communities, other communities. So my big smile has to be I am so um, pleased that we are centering God. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We are centering God, but we have to stick with his program. When we get tired, when 65 rolled around Attorney Stewart, I could have said, me personally, I'm out. But listening to the call of God, mm -hmm. I have to go until I have to keep going until he says enough. And I don't believe he's going to say enough and then put me in a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't expect that. But I'm just saying to you, being called to the work, doing the work and continuing the work. That's a whole, that's different. Okay. Anything, anything else uh, that you want to share? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Very good. I think you've done a, a, a great job of expressing yourself. And I like divergent uh, conversations. We know we all don't have to see things the same way and, and, and believe the same way. You know, I believe that that's what uh, needs to be respected more. Diverse opinions and uh, ideologies and so forth. I I have a view, and, and it's 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 not a corny view, but it goes back to uh, words that Dr. Martin Luther King shared, and it and it states that that people will be judged by their character. By the you know by their character and not by their you know their skin color and so i think that goes both ways we have to still learn how to work with everybody across the aisle the problem is in many instances we we uh have often been the individuals that's extending our hand out to work and then people don't extend the hand back fairly to work with us but we still have to use we still have to work across the aisle to make this thing turn to make this this uh wheel turn because it's a heavy heavy load a heavy burden but we got to get it done do you believe that we have to continue to reach across the aisle dean williams what are your thoughts on that well i i do but again i'll say this regardless of the gender or the ethnicity or race use discernment because all skin folk are not kin folk and all folk that don't look like us are our enemy so use discernment that's why it's so important to have god in your life center christ in your life because you need supernatural something beyond your own abilities and god will show you who to extend your hand across and who is extending what looks like a hand but it's really a viper mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh bethany what are your thoughts what are you thinking sure. well, yeah, um, I, yeah I, I was thinking about recommending to your audience to read the color of law by richard rothstein Mm -hmm. really is an excellent way with which to unpack some of what we're discussing today to talk about how structures and systems were legislated. In terms of working across the aisle, the thing that typically helps with R and D, the truth mm -hmm. is that most people are moderate. We are in the middle. It just feels like our politics are polarized, but most people actually are moderate. And typically in conversations that I've had to have with outstate Missourians, meaning not St. Louis, not Kansas City, I have to dig into my faith because I find in some of those places, the R's, Republicans, connect to faith that sometimes gives me an entry point into then being one-on-one, -on -one, finding ways of communication that we are human first and then break through some of that dogma, 
that, that, seg that segregated mentality that then once you see that, hey, a black mama that's struggling over here and a black mama that's struggling over here or a white mother, they have a whole lot more in common than they don't. And finding that commonality has been particularly successful uh, in my leadership. So I do believe in the both and and in the moderate. I do. Now, if it's ignorant, I don't have time for that. So I try to go to the center and try to go for persuasion when possible. But at the end of the day, it's too urgent. And I'd rather keep working on policy and systems change to advance this and let other people catch up. Okay, Attorney good, good. Stewart, I have additional comment. May I make it, please? Yeah, absolutely you can. I want to make an, a show an example of the risk. Now, uh, I, I don't expect anyone to, perhaps you won't agree with me, but when I think back on the Ferguson Commission when Michael Brown was killed, and I look back on those particularly young men who helped to lead that movement, mm -hmm. doesn't it concern you or your audience that many of those young men mysteriously came up missing or committed suicide? And then they fault us and say, where is the leadership? When our leadership has been killed and the, and the cases have been closed or they've been mysteriously called suicide, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. And so there are risks, life and limb risks in many cases about being verbal and visual, but still we rise. Amen. Uh, the Ferguson situation is very disturbing on on many levels. Um, not just, I mean, like I said, it's just very disturbing on many levels as it relates to how people were being uh, policed in those commun communities and pulled over and, you know, just uh, burdened with debt that they never could pay and the deaths of individuals. So there are a lot of disturbing issues that uh, have come into play. But as you know, the Department of Justice, when they came in, yeah. they did not find any uh, wrongdoing in that shooting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an Ob Obama administration that led that investigation and mm -hmm. that stated that there was no, uh, I'm not talking about the people that disappeared. I am talking about the um, the outcomes of what happened with uh with uh, the young man, Mike, Mike Brown, that was killed. So it's a lot of uh, uh, interesting things that took place with uh, that whole Ferguson situation. And, and in my opinion, it never has been resolved adequately uh, mm -hmm. and that the outcomes of the investigation was not resolved adequately because many things that uh, occurred with that investigation and how uh, they identified uh, uh, facts and how those facts applied with the law. And then there was no findings of wrongdoing. It was it's just very uh, curious, very uh, speculative. Now, since we're talking about Mike Brown, I'm going to wrap this up in a few minutes. We're going in a different direction. But let's look at this whole issue of Black Lives Matter. When people say uh, Black Lives Matter, do you think... Um, that the next statement is all lives matter, or do you think it's black lives matter? What are your thoughts on that? Bethany, I'll turn it over to you. I think the most succinct way to say it is until black lives matter, all lives truly will never be realized that they matter. So the point in that dictation, black lives matter, is really to put a punctuation on the fact that any data point that you want to bring, whether it's police, food insecurity, other elements of healthcare, chronic disease burden, trauma, that Black men, women, bodies, young people, now even our infants before they're born, are showing in their DNA that there is a weight that is undeniable that no other minority nor people who were raised white, again, I said that, people who were raised white share that same burden. And so until we are seen as human and as valuable, and yes, God is absolutely in control. And there's a good quote I like to say, do not ask the Lord to guide your steps if you're not willing to move your feet, 
even in the gospel, God decided to have a plan and man was to participate in the plan. Mm -hmm. So yes, we support by faith and we walk by faith and part of our purpose. That's why it's good to know what your purpose is, what your lane is, to be clear about that, because that is how we accelerate. Jesus sanctioned justice is what I like to call it. Right. And so being discerning, yes, Black Lives Matter, but also the Holy Spirit should be mingling into that to make sure that we stay the way that God intended for us to exact justice. And it does not belong to us. Vengeance belongs to God. But there's a difference between vengeance and justice. And I'm a person who advocates for and speaks up for justice. That is Jesus's way. OK. And, and then to chime in on that. I believe that justice is our responsibility all day long. And I believe that vengeance is God's responsibility. Absolutely. Justice starts in the scriptures. And that's why when people yeah. go to court, normally they put their hands on the Bible because that's where justice derives from, mm -hmm. from the word of God. And that we are to carry out injustice and to speak for those that are oppressed, to mm -hmm. speak for those that are facing uh, the uh, the disfavors of this society with a real solution. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you know, got me stirred up there because I think the church sometimes take a laissez-faire approach to justice and they wanna put justice on God. When God said, I'm gonna be responsible for vengeance and I want you to be responsible for justice. Okay, Dean Williams, let's wrap this up. Okay. This this, part really of quick. this has been a whole lot of fun. I have a t-shirt that I wear proudly. And when I have it on, sometimes I forget it. And it says, I'm rooting for everybody black. And I and and the reason it's almost like Black Lives Matter. So does that mean I'm not rooting for everybody? No, but specifically. I'm rooting for everybody black because we have been disadvantaged. So when you look at me, if you want to know who I'm rooting for first, I'm rooting for people who look like me because I'm I, even me. I'm going to take care of everybody else. I'm not a threat to you, but people who look like me are threatened every day. So I wear my T-shirt often and proudly. I'm rooting for everybody black. <laughs> okay. Now, you all probably going to get mad at me. I'm not going to get mad. <laughs> I believe that black lives matter because the reason why that's essential is because those are all the lives that have been at risk of harm yes. over the last uh, multiple years of shootings and uh, uh uh, stops people that are being stopped and it ends up in a shooting in the death and so the the uh, essence of black lives matter is to say hey my life is an important too yes. and i deserve the freedoms under the law to present my my case and not to be killed i am uh i deserve the right yes. to believe that i am not a danger just because you pulled me over and that I can make it home tonight. If there is a dispute, it should not rise to the level of, of murder, okay, or a shooting. My life matters as well, okay? This, that is how I see Black Lives Matter, that that individual has a right to liberty and justice and not to be uh, viewed as a threat that's worthy of death and that we are bringing attention to this issue okay and but all lives matter but this particular instance we're highlighting black lives because they have been at risk of of murder danger they're not given in the benefit of the doubt to present what's going on before the uh the first way i'm going to handle this is to pull out a gun and start shooting mm -hmm. okay so that's how i see that and, and I, I have to, you know, for me, I have to make sure that I never walk within a spirit of prejudice, okay? I just can't do that. Because in order for, for God to have his, his way to work, he has to work through a vessel 
that's going to always look at things as closely as he look at things. I agree. So I have to parallel that that vision with his vision. Now, the revelation of discernment of right and wrong, that's easy. But the hard part is, can I lift myself up to have the same type of uh, uh, revelation of individuals that he has, regardless of the color thing? That's the difficult part in really walking with God. When you when you try to see things from the from the angle that he's looking at things from. I'm not saying that you don't work to remedy the problem. Mm -hmm. I practice law. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. I advocate for the individual that's that's at risk of losing some type of a right. But I still have to look through a lens from my perspective that represents, you know, that that clarity of justice for for all individuals. Mm -hmm. So we're out of time. I want to thank you all for being with me on today. You've done a phenomenal job. I definitely want the two of you all to come back and to address some issues, some other issues that's going to come up in the news. Uh, Dean Williams, I would just applaud you uh, on your uh, advocacy for the for the community and the fight that you have in you to make things right. And then I want to also applaud you. Uh, Dr. Javar, for your uh, ascension to the CEO and president of the Deaconess Foundation and the and the lifelong work that you are doing in the city of St. Louis and the models that you are creating to allow individuals to have uh, economic justice, educational justice. We appreciate the work that you are doing. And so before we sign off, or is there anything else you would, would like to say or like to share i just want to thank you attorney stewart for allowing us to have this platform i so enjoyed this interaction and this discussion and hats off to you for opening up these type of questions for elevating uh the movement the many movements that exist and for thinking of me and my sister well you are so welcome you have been tuned in to Legal Views with Attorney Sheila R. Stewart. Please be with us on next Saturday. And thank you for spending this time with us. Stay with me a few seconds, ladies. Don't leave. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you on next week. Have a great weekend. And we love you. God bless.